Welcome back to Miller's Construction. I've got a question for you. What do you think about the look of this? How does that look to you? The walls, the ceiling, it's kind of rustic, isn't it? Like it belongs in a cabin. It's pretty cool. How would you like to be able to know how to not only install those boards and that paneling, but also how to finish them yourself? Save you a lot of money, might save you some time, I can show you exactly how to do it. This episode, Miller's Construction, we're gonna show you how to pre-finish some car siding or real wood paneling. So follow along, like and subscribe down, down below. I'd really appreciate that. Let's get right to it. First, you're gonna to need to pick up some of this real wood paneling. Now, in our area, this is what's most common. This is made out of yellow pine. It's about five and a half inches wide, each board. These boards have a V groove down the center of it, or a bead if you will, and there is a tongue on one side and a groove on the other side. You can get these in a wide variety of shapes and sizes and patterns. You can get them with or without the V groove in them. But this is what's most common in our area and it's most economical. So that's what we go with and a lot of people like it. And these are number two grade, by the way. You can see they've got some character because they've got some knots in them. All different uh, characteristics make it look a little bit more rustic like a cabin. So what's the first step? You're gonna need to sand it. You're gonna need to get you a sander. You need to get a specific sander, a random orbit sander. This is a random orbit sander. Let me show you what is not a random orbit sander. This is not a random orbit sander. This is an orbital sander. It does not rotate or spin. This will remove material much, much slower. We use this sander for drywall. So make sure to get a random orbit sander. Here's another one. This was made by Bosch. This is a good one as well. You can usually pick up a corded random orbit sander for about 60, 70 bucks at your big box store. So random orbit sander. Now, what type of sanding paper do you need to use on it? Let's just get it right into that. This is what we use. A lot of different brands out there, a lot of different types. We use 120 fine grit hook and loop sanding discs. These are do it best brand and they work just fine. They last plenty long enough. We've tried a lot of different uh, brands from Festool uh, to Diablo. We've even tried some Merca sand net. We just, we always go back to these. These, for this specific material, these work the best. And remember, this is not a piece of furniture. This is paneling, miles and miles of paneling. This might be going in the entire home. You're not pre-finishing furniture. We want it smooth, but it doesn't have to be perfect, okay? You're never gonna see it. The way we finish these, you're never gonna see the imperfections. But remember, 120 grit, fine. That's as far as you need to go for this application. Now that sounds crazy. If you are a woodworker, a DIY person, a homeowner that's done a little bit of uh, cabinet refinishing in your garage or you've refinished some furniture, you've probably read online that you need to go up to a 400 grit or even higher and you need to hand sand it and do all these extra steps. Remember, this is not furniture. All of those things that you read are probably true for what you were refinishing. They don't apply to this unless you want to waste a ton of time. Remember, this is yellow pine and it's number two grade. It's not, it's not furniture grade here paneling. So we're going to take you through the steps. Step one is the most tedious, sanding. Random orbit sander, you just got to get in a rhythm. Let me show you what you need to remove. So this board has not been sanded and you can see it's got just a little bit of machining here from being ran through the planer at the mill. All of that needs to be removed. It's going to show through the finish if you don't remove it. You'll also notice sometimes you can find little check marks or little dents and dings like this. See those little dents and dings? If you don't want to, those to show, you need to sand them out. Uh, but oftentimes you'll find these little checks where the planer has taken a little bit out of it. And you need to remove all of that. So all of, these, all of this mill glaze, all of that, it should end up looking like this. This one's been sanded. Now we do not sand in the V-groove. We do not sand on the edge. You could take that extra step, but you're gonna spend a ton of time. Our clients don't mind the roughness in the V group. They just wanna be able to run their hand over it and it's nice and smooth and it looks good. So 
This one's sanded, this one's not. You can see the color variance there. So just keep that in mind. You can, you can go crazy on this stuff and spend a lot of time, but just remember how much you're going to pre-finish. That's going to add to a lot of time if you start getting into this nitty gritty detail right here. Sand the surface smooth, call it a day. That's my suggestion. So let's just show you a little bit of sanding here. We'll just start at this end. See all this uh, mill glazing is what I call it. See that? Nice and easy. Doesn't take that long. There you go. 120 grit, random orbit sander. Time to go to town on this stuff. It's going to take a while. All right, that is our last board. Stack that up. That's 29 boards. We've got 30, but we're using the other one for a stain sampling. Let's see how much dust is in this bag real quick. I'm going to guess it's going to be pretty full. Oh, yeah, pretty good amount. I don't know if the camera can focus on that or not, but that's... It's pretty full right there, so. So we got all of our boards sanded yesterday and it's taken us a little while, but we finally came up with a stain. This is Sherwood wiping stain. They custom mixed this for us, which is really nice. I'm still not a fan of oil stains at all uh, for this project at least. I really like this Mohawk ultra penetrating stain. This stuff is fantastic, but I've lost my sample color kit so we didn't know really which color to select to order online. So we just went the Sherwin wear out and they did an absolutely phenomenal job. Even though it's an oil stain, like I said, I'm just not a fan of that for various reasons, but we're looking at this color on this side of the board right here. So once we get our clear coat on, it's gonna look really good. Um, I think they just did a fine job. So if you're in a pinch, go to Sherwin Williams, they'll custom match uh, or custom color mix you some stain. Now, we'll talk a little bit about why I don't like oil stains. It's just not, um, <clears throat> not friend, user friendly enough. I have to wipe this with a rag by hand, whereas this I can spray and it's perfectly consistent every time. It's faster, it's alcohol, so it dries crazy fast. It's cold, it's gonna be cold the next few weeks. This is gonna take at least a couple days to dry, whereas the alcohol overnight easily would dry it. So that's one of the downsides of um, oil stain, but I will say this, just like the alcohol stain, the oil stain actually does something kind of magical. Um, once it is dry, it will cause the grain to really lay down flat. So your first coat of lacquer, you won't have as much grain raise. So that is a benefit to staining these boards. If you, finish them raw like this, which we've done plenty of times, that first coat of lacquer that you spray on, it raises the grain like crazy, um, <clears throat> which we're gonna sand in between coats anyway, so it doesn't matter, but it's a little less work, a little less hassle when you stain it because the grain stays so flat and tight. So that's a nice thing to think about. Um, now, we've got a pretty good sized shop here, but it is full of tools and stuff. Um, this is a, what is this, K of 40 by 50? 40 by 50 shop, but <clears throat> space is still at a premium because of so much stuff that we have in here, right? Um, so what we're doing is we're stacking our boards lengthwise, and then we're using this system. This is the stack rack system. Now, if you'll look this company up, <clears throat> these are quite pricey, by the way. I've got a bunch of these. I had originally bought these to spray interior and exterior doors. And the way it works is one rack, this is one rack, Two of these feet, if you will, will go on one side of a door. Two feet will go on the other end of the door. And then essentially you can flip the door over. You can spray both sides of the door in one day and it's laying flat. So you don't have to worry about running. Problem with that system is every door I've ever sprayed using the stack rack system has a permanent bow in the door. So it's not really a good system. I stopped using it pretty quick after purchasing it for that purpose. But we have another purpose for them now, and we keep them for this exact project. When, whenever we come in here with long lengths of stuff that we need to pre-finish, 
It actually makes a really good racking system. So we've just got a two by four, five foot long attached to either end. And after this initial base layer, um, we'll be able to start stacking up our stack racks and we'll have just a racking system. And you can go really high with this and you can get a lot of boards in a really small confined area. So the stack rack system is really good for that. And it's actually somewhat economical um, when you look at other options. This, this, this works pretty doggone good. So anyways, let's get to uh, applying some stain real quick. I'll show you what we do um, or how we do it, I should say. All right, super important to go ahead and just blow off all of the dust from sanding each board individually before you stain it. This is the stain that we're gonna use. Once again, this is just an oil stain. Um, anytime you've got a colorant like this, a uh, stain, you wanna make sure you mix it consistently. So I might stain one, two, three boards, and then I'm gonna come back and mix it again. Mix, mix, mix. You can't mix it too often. So you wanna get a consistent color, you gotta make sure you mix it because all of the pigments or colorants they'll float down to the bottom. Now I'm just using a regular cotton terry type um, rag here, no big deal. If you'll come down here, we can show kind of the process. So what I do is I wipe probably a three or four foot section at a time, get the face of it wiped on there really nicely. But here's, here's the trick with this particular um, siding. You wanna make sure you get in that V groove, obviously, cause that's in the face, but something somewhere that a lot of people tend to miss with this stuff, not only this edge, but this tongue. You wanna make sure you get this tongue really good. And I'll tell you why. Wood expands and contracts. And sometimes it's out of our control that it might shrink enough to where you can see some bare wood that's not stained. So you wanna make sure, even though that's gonna be hidden or it should be hidden for the most part, you wanna make sure you do a really good job of staining all of that edge. Does that make sense? All right, let's get to work. We're gonna keep staining here. It'll be a while. On our last board, Kay's taking care of this one. We forgot to sand it. This was our sample board, so it's a little shorter. We've been cutting chunks off of it to make sure that our stain matched up right. So that's our last board. Here's those stack racks in place. It's kind of interesting the way that works, doesn't it? Um, so we've got three layers here. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 boards, I think, across. So we've got three layers there of boards stacked up into a relatively small space, which is nice. It's gonna be really nice when we start finishing with lacquer. The game plan is to let this dry all weekend. So today is Thursday. We're gonna let it dry Friday, Saturday, Sunday, come in Monday, should be good. Kay's gonna keep that stove nice and hot and pumping out some heat uh, during the cold. <laughs> He's shaking his head like, what? <laughs> Uh, but uh, anyways, big, big shout out to Greg up at Popper Bluff, Missouri, Sherwin-Williams. Man, he matched us up really nicely. Um, that's just, that's beautiful, man. A little bit darker on that section, but that's just this particular board. Man, that's, that's a really good match. As soon as the lacquer uh, gets on these, it's going to be great. Really nice job, Greg. Thank you. Okay, we're back in the shop and our boards are nice and dry. Let me turn you around and show you what we got going on here. So right here, we've stacked up all of our boards that we had sitting on our stack rack system. We've got our stack racks over here. So we had all those set up right here and Charlie's happy. <laughs> He's feeling good today. So we've got all these stacked up, they are really dry, which is great. Going to be wonderful for spraying lacquer. Here's the process. Here's what you have to understand. This stuff has a significant amount of overspray. If you spray a board, place it 
towards the direction that you're sucking your fumes out and then spray another board, all that overspray is going to be glazing across your freshly sprayed material. So you have to think about things like that. And coming from um, a background of a lot of painting, um, we, we, we do a lot of painting as remodelers, but we've done a lot of lacquer too. You have to think about things like that because it can really screw up your finish. So right here, this big box on the wall, that's our exhaust fan. That's going to be sucking air out of this building when I'm spraying. And we want to make sure that all of that overspray goes directly out that box and doesn't glaze the top of our finished board. So that being said, I've got my spray station set up here. I'm going to be spraying right here. And then as soon as I'm done shooting a board, it's going to be placed behind me. That way all of that overspray sprays right out that box. Now, this is the product that we're going to be using, and I'm not going to go too far into depth about it because I have a full another video on how to spray this stuff. But this is what we use. This is great for a production style setting. I will be using, let me just take you in the paint room. Grab my weapon of choice here. This is the gun that we've used for a very long time. It's just a cheap $100 Ingersoll Rand HVLP gun. You don't have to have anything special because I know someone's going to ask, what is the tip size? I think it's a 1.4 millimeter. So that doesn't really, <laughs> doesn't really affect us a whole lot. I like a smaller tip size. Just means I'm going to have to thin it a little bit more. Uh, but you want that fine rattle can style spray. Like I said, I'm not going to get into that. I've got another video that I'll link down below that fully covers how we spray lacquer. But right now, I need to get this stirred up and I need to get it thinned down with some lacquer thinner. Here's my super scientific mix. I pour about half of a gallon out into just a random container. Now I know how much uh, lacquer thinner I need to pour in here to thin it properly. My goal, let me just set this down. My goal is to get the fluid to the bottom of this circle. Yeah, super scientific. Really, really getting accurate with the measurements here. <laughs> Hope the sarcasm's coming through in the video. So I didn't quite get there with this. And this is just straight up lacquer thinner. Nothing special. Looks like I'm gonna have to open another gallon. You can see I didn't quite make it. There we go. Got it filled up to that point with thinner. Now I need to just start mixing and mixing and mixing. We want this mixed really, really good with a good paint stick. Shout out to Black's Lumber Company. The best paint sticks. You got to ask for them though. They don't just throw them on the stack like they do at Home Depot, but that's okay. Mix, mix, mix. So I've got my lacquer thinner mixed up really well. You'll notice I'm wearing gloves. That's not necessarily because it's cold in here. That's more because I get what I call trigger finger, this steel. I, it'll wear on you. Also 30 PSI at the gun. Um, so here's our first shoot. We're gonna do our first test shoot. Now this is how I pour this stuff in. I just grab it by kind of like that kind of see how i'm grabbing it there and i just kind of dump it right on in keep rolling good enough boom boom and we'll, we'll go through a little bit of this go ahead and cap it also if you're a pro sprayer and you're thinking that i don't have the right respirator on it's that's true <laughs> i don't have any filters for this so um it just is what it is people I think I'll be okay for today. We don't have that much to spray. So keep that in mind. Now I always start down there. I always start down at this end of the board. Let me shoot a little bit out here. Oh yeah. All right, can you kind of capture? See how fine that mist is? That's what you want. <laughs> you want a nice fine mist. Now. I also like to control my fan width. This is my fan width. So imagine that it's like a mouth. I want to close that fan a little bit because essentially what I'm going to have to do is I think 
I, I always end up changing. Sometimes I'll shoot one side and then come back the other side. Sometimes I'll spray the whole thing at once. Um, it just depends on how I'm feeling that day, but we'll just see how it goes. We've sprayed a ridiculous amount of this too, by the way. <laughs> so. so just right there, I can see that I'd like to tighten that up some. I think I'm gonna come back and shoot it from the other side. I, I might, I might, I might fan it out. Let's see if I can spray the whole thing. That'll work, folks. I'm just gonna shoot the whole thing. The key to lacquer, you almost can't put too much on when you're first shooting it, especially with this yellow pine. It's really gonna soak it up. Um, and you want it to level off nicely. If you don't put enough on, you're gonna have orange peel or you're gonna have dry spray. Those are two things you don't want. You wanna put enough material on. So, I'm using an HVLP sprayer. You can use an airless if you want. Airless is extremely difficult to clean up afterwards. Lacquer is going to ruin the insides of it if you use it constantly through it. I just don't like spraying lacquer through an airless machine. I've never done it because I just don't want to ruin a machine. This cup gun was purchased, I think, in 2004. Maybe earlier than that, and it it's still works fine. So it's just steel parts, easy to clean up. It's a little slower, I have to go slow with it, but it's just something that we've always used and we've had good success with. So we've got what, 30 boards to spray, okay? So um, let's get after it. Well, you don't have uh, any of these sanded. He's waiting on me. All right. All right, folks, we got a lot of sanding to do today. All of these. Sounds like Kay's already got the music rocking. It's going to be a long day. These are the sanding pads that we have always used for this application. They're made by 3M, super fine pads. They're a soft, moldable pad fairly inexpensive and they work great for this. Um, you won't feel very much grit at all on this, but you don't want that. You just want to lightly scuff the surface of the board. Now, if I feel of it right now, it's slightly hairy. There's just a little bit of grain raised, just a little bit. And that's always the case on the first coat with lacquer. So all we have to do, see how it's kind of powdering up right there? See how it's kind of chalked up just a little bit? Now when I wipe my hand across it, it's just smooth as glass. See all that dust that come off? That's all of that grain rays coming off. So we have to do every single one of these boards like that. Doesn't take very long. You can see how quickly I'm doing it here. I try to do it as fast as I can. You'll get into sections like this where you've got a little bit of extra roughness. We don't worry about the groove. We don't worry about the edges. No one's ever gonna touch that or worry about that. We're just worried about the face of the boards. All right, so we are back to the finishing stage where we need to go ahead and put another coat on. We just sanded all of these boards. 
The thing you got to keep in mind is we don't need the surface extremely clean when it comes to the dust from sanding it, that powder. All he had to do was just brush that off real quickly. You can see there's nothing on my hands. But even if there is a little bit of residue, you have to remember that with lacquer, with lacquer specifically, it's burning layer after layer after layer into itself. So unlike polyurethane or paint or primer, where you're building coats, extra coats. So you put the first coat on and then the second coat sits on top and then the third coat sits on top. With lacquer, each layer is actually melting into each other. It's burning into it. So you're actually creating a mill thickness. You're not creating coats, you're creating a mill thickness of finish that is one. Does that make sense? I hope it does. So if there's a little bit of lacquer dust on the boards that we're shooting, we're not worried about adhesion because it's just gonna melt right into itself. Hopefully that makes sense. We want it as clean as possible, obviously, but we're not crazy particular about it. Here we go. Looks really good. And that's the wonderful thing about lacquer. This bottom row is already dry to the touch. And you can see it's got that real nice, elegant satin sheen to it. These will all dry tonight. Tomorrow we will be taking these to the job site and we'll show you some installation. All right, come in here. Do a little, do a little video on this. All right, we are on the job site. And you can see we've got quite the job side here, folks. We've been doing a lot of work here. This is just a, a very small portion of the work that we're actually performing on this job. You can see we've got our dust barrier up. This is conditioned living space over here, but we're focused on tongue and groove car siding or paneling, whatever you want to call it. And this is a new board, isn't it, Kay? This is one that we pre-finished. That's old and this is new. So all, all of these are the old ones that yeah. we just... Okay, so folks, this wall was covered and we took this window out. Does that make sense? So instead of trying to scrap back together everything after the window took, came out, we took all of the boards off of this wall. Hopefully that's making sense and we're starting fresh. We were able to use some of the existing boards you can see this house is covered with that style paneling. So we had to try to match that. That was the purpose of staining and finishing new boards. We didn't have enough to cover this wall space. So this right here, this yeah, yeah. Show how great it matches. Once again, Sherwin-Williams matched this stain for us. And you can see they did just an absolutely awesome job. Thank you, Greg, Popper Bluff, Sherwin-Williams. Fantastic job. So what Kay's trying to do right now is we're trying to keep this as tight as possible um, in this corner, but we actually want a little bit of a relief cut. You can see the gap at the bottom for expansion and contraction. So this stuff will expand and contract over time. You wanna be mindful of that. So what we do, we like to put it tight where it's gonna be visible, and then hopefully it will grow to the gap instead of bowing off the wall. Hopefully that makes sense. Now, Kay is using the hammer of Thor, AKA the uh, dead blow hammer so that he doesn't mar the finish on the material. The nailer he's using is the Pazload cordless, the new style 16 gauge finish nailer, angled finish nailer. And it works very well for this application. We love Pazload nailers, they just work. And we are using 
two inch nails, two inch finish nails. All we have to go through is this little section here. You can kind of see the hole if I zoom in. You can see where he's nailing that. So that will be hidden by the next board and we are nailing directly through the drywall into the stud. So two inch really is all you need. And these hold very tight like that. Two inch angled finish nails. We've got to cover this whole wall. And this is kind of a unique application, running it at a 45 like this. Kind of gives it a cool effect. Uh, wasn't our idea, this is the homeowner's. In fact, the client uh, installed this himself. So uh, we're just trying to match up with what he's got. We wanted to do this, kind of a, kind of a backstory why we took the window out. Uh, we're putting a staircase up here and this is gonna be a loft, new loft that we're building up here. So this was next on the list, but it's looking good. Looks like our color match. Color. That's nice, isn't it? Color's good. Yeah, color's really good. But you can see that relief cut there at the bottom, folks, where we've got room for expansion. Got a little bit snug on one, but that's not a big deal. Those were there. Yeah, okay, those were already in place. I forgot about that. So, yeah. Out here in the garage, this is our stack of pre-finished material. This is what we finished in the shop. And we are breaking it down just with a circular saw and a simple framing square. And then we're using the miter saw to kind of touch it up if our, our, our wall is kind of out of plumb in there. So we want those joints to be nice and tight. So you can see Kay here, he's not cutting this on a perfect 45. He's having to trim a little bit off. You can see he just took a little bit off of the point here. Um, not a true 45, just because the wall's out of plumb, but we want to take the time to make that joint nice and tight where it matters most. But you don't have to have a miter saw to do all of this. You can do it all with a circular saw, but it's just going to be a lot less accurate. So we're using both. These are 16 foot long boards. I don't like having to struggle uh, to carry the 16 foot long boards over there and having them flap every which way. I don't want to put my miter saw wings on and all that stuff. So circular saw to break them down and then we fine tune them on the uh, miter saw. I want to show you guys something before I cut this board. You notice we've got this unsightly split here. You can see how far it extends. It stops right about here. So I'm going to come back and I'm going to cut that off. This is all trash waste to me. You really have to pay attention to your boards. You, you might want to call it a grading system. Um, anytime before you start cutting, you want to cut that trash out. For instance, this particular board is a good example. It's got a knot missing. It's got some burn marks from a planer or something, and it's got some tie down marks. So this entire piece, I probably won't use for anything. And you can see where I cut it. I cut it way back here. This is all just most likely waste. That might could have been avoided by picking my own lumber at the lumber yard, but it happens. Uh, you're gonna get some defects like this. You just gotta make sure you pay attention to it. Don't just start cutting and trying to save as much as you can because it's just not worth it. That split is unsightly. Let's get rid of it. And I'm making sure that this is really nice and tied up here. We've already discussed that. But something you have to keep in mind is these boards aren't perfectly straight. They're warped, they're cupped, they're kind of all over the place. That's just the nature of pine. So what we like to do is we're working from the top and working our way down the board. So we'll just show you this process. Now that I'm nice and tied up at the top, I'm gonna go ahead, slam a couple nails in up there, and then I'm gonna work my way down hitting the studs. And all the way along through there, I need to make sure that this joint is nice and tight. You can see down here that we're not tight at all. We're actually off quite a bit. So as I, as I come down this board, I'm gonna make sure that I tighten that up. So I'm gonna be constantly pushing down and pushing that, that tongue into the groove. But I wanna make sure I'm hitting studs and we've got that marked out. You can't just nail this stuff up to drywall. It's never gonna hold like that. So see how I'm kind of just beating it down? And you can use one of these dead blow hammers as well. I should probably be using that, save my hand. But um, you can give it a little tap, kind of tap it into place. 
and that does a really nice job there. I know I've got a stud here. Also, the angle of your gun is very important. If you'll, if you'll see kind of the angle of it, you want to make sure that your nail is not exposed on the back side, but also that it's not visible on the front side. So if I, if I just kind of follow the angle of this 45 or whatever this is, um, where they've cut this tongue on here, if I just follow that, that nail's going to follow that. And you can see there, that won't show on our finish but it also won't get in the way back here when our groove slides over our tongue. Hopefully that makes sense for you. So just a couple of quick tips there. Now, on occasion, you'll get into a board that is exceptionally warped. Maybe it's perfect at both ends, but it's warped in the middle and you can't pull it down. In situations like that, you might have to set up like a wedge system where you knock a wedge or you, you fasten a wedge to the wall and tap another wedge to tighten that, does that make sense? I, I, maybe we'll get an opportunity to show you that in a video, but there are ways that you can uh, pull that board into place and then fasten it. Just like that, all of our tongue and groove, car siding, what we call it car siding, wood paneling, it's all been installed and we think that it turned out so nice. A couple extra points before I let you go on this video. If you are remodeling, we do not recommend installing this over bare studs. You want some sort of substrate behind there. So in other words, you're gonna want drywall or some type of plywood, OSB, something like that. If you've got a current room that's been drywalled, you can put this right over the top of that drywall. We just don't recommend installing this over bare studs because it's not going to be a sufficient air seal. Every one of these cracks, air can kind of come through there and you might feel it, especially if your exterior of your home isn't sealed up very tight. And unfortunately, in the United States especially, we have leaky homes, right? So we highly recommend installing this over some form of substrate. Drywall is okay. OSB or plywood is better, especially if you tape the seams, just to keep the airflow to a minimum. Hope that this video um, really helped you guys look for more step-by-step how-to videos on my page coming very soon. If you found this video helpful, please hit that like button and subscribe. That really helps us out helps support the channel, and helps us to create more videos for you. So we'll see you on the next one here at Miller's Construction. Thank you.